Hello everyone and welcome back to another Whose Power Rankings Is It Anyway? Yes, where it is all made up and the power rankings don't matter. We're into the end, the final stretch. Two teams remaining, I think no one is surprised which two teams are still here. But we're finally closing out our entire power ranking, so let's go over it. Let's just get into it. There's honestly not a whole lot to talk about with these teams because they haven't changed a whole lot and they have a proven system. So it's going to be more identifying what has changed and what effects that's going to happen uh, have on the team. So let's start with the San Francisco Shock going into the S plus tier. The champions, two times back-to-back -back champions, coming back for another season. And they are looking still to be one of the best teams in the league. It's an interesting thing because opposed to Shanghai Dragons, they've actually made a lot more impactful moves as well. So let's go over those as well. So... We obviously have the core that we usually have. So let's talk about the tanks and let's talk about the support lineup uh, to start with because that's the most consistent part. So the tanks are staying the exact same way that we've seen from San Francisco Shock for the last two seasons that got them their championship. They have Smurf and Choi Hyobin who are primarily the mainstays, but in certain situations, Super comes in. Usually play that Reinhardt, play that Roadhog. Honestly, Super's come into play a lot over the last two years. Uh, even Genji, which uh, for better or for worse, yes, he did play Genji last season. So this is a great tank roster. Choi Hyobin is incredibly flexible and also so good at pretty much every off tank area. There are some people who are like, maybe his Zaya isn't as good as other things. I don't know. I, you, can, you can make those arguments, but I think Choi has shown time and time again that if you put him onto a hero. If he needs to play something, he will get phenomenal at it. So I have faith in that. And then Smurf has just always been so good on this uh, Wrecking Ball, the Winston, the Orisa, all those kind of things that they've needed him on. And then as I said, Super is the Alpha Chad that's going to come in and drop some hammers, hit some hooks, all that good stuff. So I very well-rounded. I don't expect Super to get a whole lot of playtime. Uh, once again, kind of like we saw last season, unless we end up in a Brawl meta. So we'll see uh, as time goes on. Uh, looking at the support lineup, we have Violet and Twilight, once again, going back-to-back -back as the double flex support. Um, the major difference for this team is we have FD God coming in in replacement of Moth. And there's a lot of back and forth about this, uh, this change. So, obviously, I think it wasn't really released what happened, but I think Moth wanted to go somewhere else. I think he wanted to put his sort of footprint somewhere else that isn't, wasn't just the shock, so he went over to the Gladiators. But now we have FD God, who came from the Paris Eternal, who had... An incredible debut season on the Paris Eternal last season, on the Lucio primarily. Just somehow booping the world's greatest players as if it was nothing, like he's booping gold players. His movement is incredible. He's just honestly shown to be a very well-rounded main support. The major difference you're going to see between FD God and Moth is FD God is way more aggressive. And I think that worked very well in the style that Paris Eternal played. But I don't know if that is essentially the identity of the San Francisco Shock. So I'm curious to see, well, especially not the identity of the way Moth played. Moth made a lot of big plays, but it was generally pretty reserved with how he played the game. We're going to see a new structure come in here for the San Francisco Shock. How is FD God going to be implemented into this team to be successful? And is he going to play the exact same way that he played on Paris Eternal? No one really knows. Time will tell. That is the, the question that's sort of being thrown around is FD God, is he going to fit into this roster? He's talented enough. It all comes down to synergy. So we'll see. We'll see. And then the next thing that we need to talk about is the DPS lineup. Because this is where we've seen the most changes. So obviously on the back of Arns, on the back of Rascal, they had a ton of success uh, last season. Obviously Rascal showed a ton of flexibility with Echo coming in, being able to play so many different things. Historically in the 2019 season, Rascal played the Baptiste in that sort of Baptiste Goats. Sort of innovated a lot of new things for this team. We see both of those players out. So we are going to keep Striker in that Tracer spot. I expect to see him sort of stay in his exact same role if he comes in to play Tracer, murders everybody, and then goes home. Um, Tayo is a is kind of an anomaly of this team. Got picked up during the, I would say, the slump of the San Francisco Shock in expectations that they needed a Genji player. Tayo only played it once, I believe. I think he only played one match, and it wasn't against any good team, I don't believe. So it wasn't it wasn't like we got to see too much of him. I'm curious to see how he's going to be utilized in this season, if he's going to be utilized. He is primarily a flex DPS player. Um, but when you have a player, like a new addition like Nero, who I think many would argue is one of the up and... Well, not even up and coming. He's been around for a while. He's trying to make his name this season 
for the best Western flex support that we uh, flex DPS, sorry, that we have in the game. Uh, he wasn't really able to show that on Guangzhou Charge. Got kind of visa held and was never able to play consistently over long periods of time. With everything that's going on, he's also playing on a Chinese Korean mixed team. Now we get to see Nero step into what arguably the best team to ever play in the Overwatch League. And he is going to be their primary player. I expect Nero to play over Tayo a lot. And I want to see him really blossom this season into something that's going to be actually incredible. Because he has the mechanics. If you've ever seen Nero play the game, he's insane. Is he going to be able to do that with such an incredible team around him? You know, only time will tell. And another person who's stepping into big shoes is Glister who is coming in in replacement of Arns, who just recently moved to Valorant. Uh, but he retired due to mental uh, health issues and then is now going on to Valorant. So Glista has to come in and prove that he can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the legacy that Arns left behind, which was just incredible hit scan that put the shock on his back time and time again last season. Glista had a pretty good season for the London Spitfire, well, as, as good of a season as you can have on the London Spitfire and what that team was last season. So I think everyone's really interested to see Glista, is he going to be able to step up to that role kind of like the way Nero is of you have to be one of the best now. You need to be the player that puts the San Francisco shock on your back and just wins games against some of the best hits get in the world. I think everyone has belief that all of these players, FD God, Nero and Glista can step into this role on this team. That is why they were picked up by Krusty. If Krusty believes in them, there's obviously a good reason to that faith. And I think everyone does, but that puts a lot of question marks on the San Francisco Shock team. Those are three core mainstays that existed with their previous Shock roster that are no longer there and now needed to be filled by another player. If any one of them fail, it could be a, a big issue. If Nero can't step into that flex DPS role at the level that they need him on certain heroes for whatever reason, that's going to be a major issue. Same thing with Glista, same thing with FD God. So they might be left with a hole. I don't think many people are expecting that. Everyone still has them in the S plus tier. The real question becomes not whether they can be one of the best in the league. Can they win it all again? Can they go for that three-peat? And the next team in that is sort of going against them would be that Shanghai Dragons once again. Are they going to be able to beat them at the very end? Uh, we do need to talk about uh, the, coaching, uh, the coaching staff of this team as well. Uh, sorry, where are they? So we have Krusty as the head coach who has been just incredible. If you don't know who Krusty is, you haven't been paying attention. He has been... By far the best Overwatch coach to ever play the game, uh, to ever coach the game. He coached Boston Uprising in Season 1 and turned that mediocre team into a very, very good team, into a perfect stage team. Has then since moved to the San Francisco Shock and just turned them into the championship they are now. So they actually have a couple of new additions. They have Kasaurus and Agape coming uh, in as the assistant coaches. So Kasaurus has been bouncing around Overwatch for a really long time, originally with Atlanta Reign, and then Young and Beautiful, a very successful contenders team. Um... And then we have uh, Agape, who was originally from the London Spitfire during their uh, championship run way back in the day. And I think he actually went back, right? Yeah, he went back and he coached them during uh, throughout all the uh, most recent seasons as well. Uh, and then they have two analysts, Aligned and Mercy, who I, I don't know a whole lot about. I haven't really seen their, um, their thing. But let's just look at the... They have a general manager. They have a assistant general manager. They have, I would say, one of the most stacked coaching rosters and manager rosters in the league. They just have so many people... And that is a result of their success. Um, and But uh, because of that, their success has come from them willing to put resources into coaching and understanding how important that is for the team. And that's why Shock, every person who plays for the Shock seems to get infinitely better just because of the uh, structure that they have behind them. So phenomenal team. I think the Shock are poised to be one of the best team, uh, well, potentially the best team in the league again. I... We'll put my money on a team at the end of this. All right, let me let me talk about the Shanghai Dragons. Maybe I'll convince myself not to go with the Shock. But yes, the final team that goes into the S-plus region is the Shanghai Dragons. And this should be a shock to nobody. Incredible team playing out of the Eastern region. I expect Sh Shanghai to have another dominant season where they are pretty much untouched. But they have made some changes just like the Shock have. So we have... Uh, let's go over the whole team. Uh, starting from the DPS lineup. So we have... Flutter and Lip, as I would say, probably the mainstays of the DPS lineup. They played most of last season, and when they didn't play that DPS lineup, they had a significantly worse win percent uh, playing six, uh, playing like DM or just sort of mixing something else in with like Ding. So 
they've actually released Ding. So Ding, someone who historically has been with the Dragons forever, was there when they won the stage. You know, he, he did great things for them with his uh, flex DPS on his Farah, but he will not be coming back uh, this season. In ad addition to the roster, they have DM coming back. DM left the Shanghai Dragons. I don't know if it was him saying he wants to explore other opportunities and then not finding anything he wanted and then re-signing with Shanghai, or if Shanghai were like, we want to look at other opportunities but couldn't find anything better than DM. I don't really know how that whole circle went. If someone knows, let me know. Uh, but DM is back on the lineup, even though he took a quick break from them during the offseason. And then we have Ursa making the addition in sort of replacement of Ding uh, for the Shanghai Dragons. And Ursa is a really interesting one. I think if going into the 2020 season, some people had Ursa being their MVP for the entire season for the Atlanta Reign. He was so good in 2019, especially on that Tracer. But in 2020, in the Atlanta Reign, we have no idea what happened. It hasn't even really been made public, but Ursa just barely even played. He didn't get much playtime. He wasn't playing any of his signature heroes. Came in bits and pieces to play May, but wasn't very impressive on it. Just for someone who had so much talent and hype leading into 2020 season, just sort of went amiss. So coming on to now a dominant Shanghai Dragons roster, I expect to see him sort of making his name a little bit more. I don't know where he 100% fits in what heroes he's going to play. I don't expect him to play the Tracer while Fletter is on this roster. He showed Fletter was incredible last season. Ursa didn't show a willingness to want to play that. So where Ursa gets implemented, not 100% sure. But, you know, having Ursa on your bench is never going to be a bad thing. So that is a very solid DPS lineup. I think it is probably better than it was last season with the addition of Ursa instead of Ding. Uh, but once again, I want to see them play Fletter and Lip. Lip is incredible. Had a great la uh, season last year and Fletter was obviously the owl mvp so you can't there's nothing wrong there let's move on to the tanks because this is where uh one of the biggest shifts happened for the shanghai dragons in my opinion between uh this season and last season so we have void coming in as the off tank that i know johnny doubted him last season even i doubted him a little bit going into that season like void played for the glad he wasn't that he's really good he's really really good he was by far one of the best off tanks that we had in the league just dominating on that sigma Will we be able to see him do more on our other heroes? Almost certainly. Uh, almost certainly. There's no doubt there. The question raised is they have fate coming in, into this run uh, roster. So, Fearless had an incredible season, but it is interesting that they made the switch, got rid of Fearless, and picked up Fate. So, Fate has a ton of history with uh, Coach Moon and Dongsu from LA Valiant when I was on that team. Uh, very smart player. Just... That, I don't think he is mechanically better than Fearless. I think Fearless is just mechanically better than Fate, probably on a lot of different heroes. But Fate is very, very smart. And you can see that in the way he plays the game, but I also have personal experience with it. He just he knows how to navigate the whole team, knows how to lead them, knows how to direct them. And I wonder if that is what the recognition that the coaching staff had from Shanghai Dragons last season, that sometimes they just get a little lost. They need that leader in-game, and Fate can definitely do that for you. So I'm excited to see what he brings to this roster. I wouldn't say it's a downgrade or an upgrade. I would say it's a side grade, and it's kind of like a different improvement in a, def a different field of you're reducing your mechanical uh, ability, but you're also increasing your uh, strategical ability. So, and it's not like Fate is a slump when I say reducing mechanical ability. He can play pretty much everything at the level that you need him to but fearless is just incredible so that is what we're going to see from fate i'm interested to see how that's going to work and how that's going to um you know function for this whole team and if it's going to you know really add to the the level that fate is going to bring and elevate them above the san francisco shock time will tell and then for the support lineup we have Iziaki, lee jay gun the classics that we saw from them last season i don't think if you ask anyone they need to change obviously Lee J gone sort of gets memed a little from the finals that happened. He definitely fed a little bit on the Lucio, but you can't doubt Lee J gone's just ability and mechanical prowess on the main support. He is one of the best that we have in the league. Just he needs to be able to tap into that and pull back when he uh, when is required of him when he's getting punished. And Iziaki is just does it time and time again. He's just been thriving on a Korean roster, on the Anna, on the Zen, on everything. Interestingly, they picked up Molly as well, who came from the Chengdu Hunters, who is one of the diamonds in the rough that from the Chengdu Hunters. He was really good on the Anna last season. And I think that is probably where we might see him come and pick it up more for this team up. But they have double flex support, which I really like in the roster in case we go to like an Anna Zen. Even just being able to have a flex support play the uh, like a BAP Anna 
a Bap Zen, who knows? I think having that addition is going to be great for them because he proved that he is actually incredible. So I'm excited to see how he is implemented into this roster as well. So that's the whole team. As I said, not a whole lot of changes, but if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I think they've made some minor adjustments and I think that they believe in themselves enough that they can beat the shock this time around without making too many uh, too many changes. Uh, let's look at the coaching. Uh, we got Moon, we got Dongsu, we got J Field, we got Kong. So we got four different uh, coaches. I think these guys have a pretty illustrious career. Uh, pretty much all of them were around for the season. They all joined in 2019. So they've all been around for the success of the Shanghai Dragons. I think they had a, a good formula there. They had a Kong come in as well towards the start of the season. I don't know much about Kong, but I've worked with Moon and Dongsu, both very smart people. So I'm interested to see how they're, uh, how they're going to do. Because it, it, it now comes onto everybody, right? Of who are you putting your money on the San Francisco shock of the Shanghai Dragons. I don't think you can realistically put money on either any other team below them as much as other teams could have a good season and they could potentially contest with these. I don't think this early on, you can put it on anyone else. Do I think shock is going to three peat or do I think Shanghai Dragons is going to overcome? It's a very good question. I'm going to put my money on the San Francisco Shock. I think I'm going to do it again. I think... I think... Nero is going to be really big for the Shock. I think FD God might add a little bit more spice to the team. I think I think I just have to put it on the Shock. I It could easily go either way. And honestly, we won't know until we start seeing the season and start getting an initial look. Um, and fortunately throughout the entirety of the season, hopefully we're going to be seeing these matches between the Shock and the Shanghai Dragons between the end of these stages, uh, like pseudo stages. So we'll see. But for now, um, the San Francisco Shock will, uh, will be my number one, but they definitely both deserve to be in the S plus tier. So that's it. We've, we've rounded out my list, but I do just wait. I do want to make some changes because I think it's really important, uh, to, adapt and recognize we've been given more information so from here if you haven't seen it recently myxl recently did an open screen with the guangzhou charge and it was my first look at myxl and one of the reasons they were down here in the b tier was just because i hadn't seen anything i wasn't i wasn't informed i didn't know how good everyone was but i was very impressed with what i saw from the myxl team this isn't a team that's going to be all of a sudden jump up to s tier but they definitely have the pieces i think myxl can easily move up into this a tier they they went 50-50 with the Guangzhou charge. Uh, I actually think they looked... They looked good. I think they were a little lost with their... Um, with their composition switches at some times. Like, they, they wanted to avoid Brawl pretty much at all times. Uh, Feather's May was not impressive. Like, I was really impressed with Guangbung, Flora, and Feather. They showed a ton of flexibility. Uh, Flora and Feather, uh, and even Ivy's traces looked really good. Like, really, really good. Honestly, picking apart Guangzhou Charge and just outplaying Eileen across the board. Guangbung looked really good on that hit scan, making some incredible shots. I can see him competing with the best. I do have some compositional issues, as I said. If you want to go understand that better, go look at my uh, my VOD of the open review because uh, on my YouTube because it definitely breaks down a lot more and you see it as it happens. Some weaknesses, but I definitely think they just individually they were better than I uh, thought they were going to be and I finally got to prove it so I'm putting them in the A tier you guys can stop yelling me in the comments this isn't because of you this is because I finally have information um but this just goes to show you how stacked this season is uh like I don't think I can move any of these teams down I really don't like Toronto and Atlanta maybe but I, I, I honestly think the Atlanta's going to be really good. I think they've made some great additions, especially with Kai coming into the lineup. And then Toronto was kind of like a sleeper pick of the season. Of They actually have a lot of great talent. And they're kind of going under the radar. So I kind of want to keep Toronto in A. But people that I'm not, are not stacked and I'm not excited for in the season is the LA Valiant. Um, they happened to fail management tier because we didn't know what the roster was coming into this uh, power rankings. We know what the roster uh, is now. And I'm going to leave them down here at failed management tier because it just doesn't look good. It really does not look good for this uh, roster. If you haven't seen it, it's... Wait, actually, let's have a look at it. Let's have a look at it. Los Angeles. Uh, oh my God, what did I just do? 
Let's hope that's not something that is like leaking my IPs or something. No, we're fine. Um, we're going to Los Angeles Valiant and let's have a look at this roster real quick uh, before we shut this video down and close this all out. So we have Crystal coming in, which I know a lot of people are upset about, but he's been given another opportunity. But interestingly, the, the thing that you need to note about this is historically Crystal has been sort of a flex DPS with a little bit of hit skin uh, mixed in. Mon Lanarin is the flex DPS of this team. He's played Diva and Brig, but I assume that's just GOATs. But I don't know enough about this guy, but from what I've heard and what I've read about a lot of these people is they're saying he's going to be the flex DPS and Crystal is going to be the hit scan DPS. So the question becomes, is Crystal going to be able to compete at the highest level on hit scan? Maybe. We know he's a good player, but how's that, how's that going to match up? Only having two DPS players is obviously a massive weakness in the league unless you have a Prophet or a Fletter, but neither one of these players are that. Uh, the tank lineup... Uh, is a big issue because uh, we we have Silver 3 who just was, as far as we're aware, like a pretty middle-of-the-pack main tank player. What No one's ever really been super impressed with what he has. Um, we have Shocheng and MVM who I don't know as much about. I think both of these players are pretty good. Shocheng was a DPS player turned flex DPS player. Uh, sorry, flex tank player. So he was originally a DPS player, but has then uh, since converted, I think when Sigma was meta to the flex uh, tank. So apparently has a phenomenal Sigma, but does not have anything else really in his lineup. So we don't know how good he is at D.Va. And we know D.Va is very hard to pick up, even if you can play the Sigmas and stuff like that. Can he play the Zaya? We, we don't know. It, it, it just adds a question. Um, and then we have... I thought this was MVM. But it might just be... Okay, they might be... I don't know exactly how this works. I haven't seen this. But with, then we have MVM, who I don't really know a whole lot about. Uh, and that is a big issue that a lot of people have. Unless you're very ingrained with the Chinese uh, scene, you don't really know who these players are. And these aren't the best players that could come out of the region. Apparently, they were having issues of they were going to acquire good players, but then uh, they weren't willing to pay buyouts for these higher uh, for these higher end players that were already on contenders teams because they're signing a roster so late and contenders has already started so they weren't willing to buy out contenders players they want to pay everyone minimum and then players also didn't want to sign with this roster like we heard dia say he doesn't want to sign up with this valiant roster come back to overwatch league and go 0 and 16 again like this team if you just look at the them on paper they're not good and a lot of good players don't want to join a not good roster because that is almost career suicide so that is why we saw all these like good players that exist within the region just not willing to join the valiant for all those uh reasons that i just highlighted then we have high who is a off tank player playing main support and we've seen tank players play main support and it is hard you lucio was not just something that you can just pick up overnight at the overwatch league level it takes a lot of time and a lot of work does he know how to play mercy at the highest level a lot of off tank players don't uh, that is a big question mark for these guys is he going to be able to do this in the overwatch league uh, we don't know and then we are actually is probably one of the players that everyone is most hyped about uh, he's you know, he's a flex support. He originally played for Guangzhou Charge back in the day, but I don't think ever really got much play time. So kind of got sort of screwed with the whole situation, but he is one of the more talented players on this roster. So he's person to look out for. Maybe he'll prove himself and get back into the league uh, next season. But overall, you look at it all, it's it ain't impressive. It ain't impressive. JP Cat and Hiko as head coach and assistant coach, they only have two people. They don't have a manager. They don't have, we don't, they don't have anything. More of the story, if it seems like I don't know what the hell is going on, it's because I don't know what the hell is going on. Not a lot of people do. We'll see. Anyone who knows anything about this has said this is an 0 and 16 team, and it's kind of hard to refute that. So 0 and 16 is where probably where they're going to stand. They're going to stand failed management tier. So sad to see. I'm hoping it, it, it isn't going to be that way because I talked about this on stream. It's all fun and games to have like a dark horse team or this team that has like really bad players and maybe they can have a glow up and haha, it'll be funny if they go 0-16. It is for the first few games until it gets really sad, especially if it's not competitive even the least. If it gets to a point that they're just getting blown out, remember they're competing in the East with some of the most stacked rosters in the league. It could be really sad to watch. And I really hope something happens that stops this from happening because this is like watching a car crash about to happen. So 
fingers crossed something changes but if not it's, it's going to be a dark season for la valiant it's going to be it's been a dark year for pretty much everyone i don't know who's supporting this team at this point so that's it that's the final power rankings i hope you guys really enjoyed the videos it was it was a lot of fun doing you guys really enjoyed it the back and forth is great i do want to reiterate it doesn't matter it's all made up power rankings are stupid but they're fun to do at the start of the season. It's fun to speculate. It all starts in about three weeks. And that's when it really matters. And we're going to be able to actually see these teams prove us all wrong. And, uh, you know, put it in their own hands. So thank you very much for watching. I really appreciate all your support throughout this whole thing. Make sure to keep tuning into my YouTube. Uh, subscribe to the YouTube. Come check out my Twitch. Uh, if you guys want to talk more about the league. Especially as it happens. I'm going to be uploading more VODs. Reviews. All those kind of things. So make sure to do that. Love you all. Thank you for joining me. Peace out.